information, and uh, thank you everybody for what's been a, a brilliant couple of days, and it's just been a pleasure to get to know you guys. Um, so my paper, in, in some ways, follows on nicely from Brian's, and in some ways it takes a slightly different tack. Um, I have to confess, I'm more a consumer of philosophy than uh, an articulator of it. This is going to be kind of an empirically led paper, and it's not even actual empirical research that's been done yet. I'm sort of presenting to you uh, a review of uh, kind of gray literature filtered through assemblage theory, um, but uh, hopefully you'll see kind of what I'm doing. And, and in a way, I, I, I kind of regret in a way not talking about my book that's coming out, because in a way it helps situate this. So I'll very briefly just say uh, that I have this book coming out, which I would love for you all to buy, uh, because if everyone in this room bought it, that would be probably 30 people more than would uh, will buy it <laughs> in total. Um, but it's called Diplomatic Material. And, and what I have been doing since I started getting into assemblage theory, largely informed by um, some of the people in this room, uh, I've been trying to take what I considered a very kind of exciting theorization of politics um, and, and in a way to drag it back into some of the most boring elements of international relations and political geography. So uh, for, for a couple of decades now, it's been kind of uncool to talk about the state in political geography. And uh, I saw this as kind of an interesting way to try and think about the state in a kind of everyday materialized sense. And so um, the book itself is, is essentially tracing different kinds of diplomacy, sort of the interconnections between governments uh, that don't have 21 gun salutes and red carpets and all that kind of stuff. So trying to think about sort of shared materialities, whether they're about human bodies circulating between governments um, in, through like secondment programs uh, or conferences, or whether it's about uh, shared databases for intelligence gathering, um, you know, for instance, quite famously between Britain and the US. And, and then one of the case studies was about NATO interoperability. So trying to think about the material connections between militaries uh, and that's the one that I'm kind of running with today. So uh, I want to talk to you about some, some research that I'd like to do. Um, so this is a picture of uh, Combined Task Force 150, uh, which as you can see from the map in the, uh, if you can, in the lower left hand corner, is sort of meant to be policing this uh, element of the Indian Ocean. The bit, in, uh, the bit oh excuse me, outside of that, it's the, the blue bit down here. Uh, and then there's another combined task force which is fighting piracy right off the coast there. And what's interesting about this, as the name implies, combined task force, is that every one of those ships comes from a different navy. Uh, and so I've become kind of intrigued by something that I see as a wider phenomenon uh, beyond, for instance, NATO, where interoperability is a pretty obvious thing. Uh, but then kind of more broadly, it seems like uh, when military conflict occurs in the world, it tends to happen with coalitions, uh, even, for instance, the stuff going on just across the way in Syria, where you have uh, the Russian Air Force and the American Air Force and the British Air Force, which, you know, uh, the Russians and the Americans doing very different things in, the, in a very small place and yet coordinating with each other to make sure that they don't tangle with each other in a way that could become an international incident, right? So, in a way, you have this interesting assemblage between rivals, right, trying to prevent things from escalating. And so I think we can kind of see this as something of a global phenomenon. There is, there is definitely an increasing push for what I've termed transnational militarism. Now, I've deleted, usually this slide has something about assemblage theory. I will not uh, uh, <laughs> lecture everyone at the end of two days about what it is. Um, but I did think I might mention some of the literature from political geography that I was drawing from. There's literature that I've been kind of loosely terming the new statecraft, which is a group of people trying to think through um, processes of kind of everyday performance of the state, the way in which the state becomes materialized and enacted in everyday ways, and sustained through a variety of materialization. So uh, Joe Painter has a great paper called Prosaic Geographies of Stateness, which looks at all kinds of ways in which everyday life is saturated by the state uh, and kind of dissolves the boundaries between public and private. Uh, Fiona McConnell has excellent work on the Tibetan government in exile, right, a state without a territory and the way in which that is sustained over many decades now. Um, Alison Mounts' work on biometric borders and the sort of materiality of the state and the way it collects biometric data, et cetera, and the way in which we all become um, part of the algorithms that 
sustain borders, whether we want to or not. Uh, and Alex Jeffrey's recent book on the improvised state, which kind of takes a humanities-led uh, kind of focus on performance and thinks about a variety of coexisting state projects in the same space. Now, none of these people are explicitly situating themselves through assemblage theory, but I think the, the sense of becoming and the sort of contemporariness of these embodied performances saturates all of them, and to a certain extent, materiality, especially Joe Painter and Alison Mounts. So my kind of starting point was to think, you know, okay, well, if we can think of the state as an assemblage, which uh, we certainly can, um, why stop there? Why not start thinking about the ways in which states become enmeshed with each other in pretty permanent ways, right? Some of these institutions, I mean, even if we just think about traditional diplomacy, right, the diplomatic system, these existed for many hundreds of years, uh, we can think about states as always being in relation to each other. And then what is it that those existing relationships and materializations do for, for instance, elite uh, political subjectivities, right? What, what does it mean for statescraft? Uh, and to a lesser extent, especially since we're thinking about the everyday state, what about for, for instance, everyday sailors, right, who are acting in the combined task force? Um, so I'm very much interested in contributing to state theory, uh, but I'm also trying to think about something else, right, the formation of a sort of global state, uh, which is, in a way, not as hierarchical, right, you can't point to a single leader of it in the way that we can normally point to a, a sort of hierarchical state, although there are obviously power hierarchies within this assemblage of states, uh, which, you know, is somewhat self-evident. So, getting into a little bit of the nitty-gritty here, I became interested in this phenomenon, which is now called uh, the Global Network of Navies. Uh, the, all the acronyms, by the way, the moment you start dealing with the military, it's all acronyms all the time. Uh, I'll try to go slowly, but, and hopefully I remember them all, because who knows. Um, it was originally called the Thousand Ship Navy. This was a, an initiative put out by the U.S. Navy in 2005. Um, the idea was to, if you will, enroll all sorts of ships, whether they're naval ships, coast guard ships, um, maritime patrol craft, you know, around the world into this kind of big force. Now, you might not be surprised that uh, the rest of the world heard the U.S. Navy saying, we would like all your ships to create a Thousand Ship Navy, and that didn't go over so well, so they rebranded it, the Global Maritime Partnership, uh, which did a little better in terms of catching on, um, but even then it's sort of too singular, right? It's a partnership, so they went to the Global Network of Navies, which is sort of satisfyingly plural uh, and doesn't eliminate anybody. So the description, as you can see, a global maritime partnership that is self-regulating and without treaties. Uh, so if you will, it's a sort of... Um, kind of constant provisional alliance of ships coming together for particular purposes in particular places. Uh, and if you want to be, you know, kind of cynical about it, you can say, um, you should, of course, be cynical about it. Um, a lot of this might be understood as an effort for the U.S. Navy to continue to maintain a global presence and to maintain a sort of constabulary function uh, over the global commons uh, during times of real financial crisis, right? So there was the period of sequestration in which the U.S. budget was um, flatlined, and that was a real threat to the U.S. Navy's ability to maintain all the ships that it had. If you want to be slightly more positive, and this is certainly the bit that they will tell you about in the brochure, uh, the, the global network of navies is really about being able to come together whenever there is a, a moment of crisis, whether it's a tsunami or uh, piracy issues or some other sort of threat to the global system, um, uh, that, that ships from different navies should be able to come together. It's actually an interesting thing to look at communication uh, among ships. It used to be, right, we had this, uh, I'm, I'm watching black sails right now, I don't know if anyone else has seen it, right, it's all about the flags you can run up. It was actually very easy to communicate with other ships of the day because everyone had the same flags, everyone had the same stuff. Um, but, of course, as communication uh, technologies have become more and more advanced, you start to see real stratification between different navies with the kind of technology that they have. And so it's actually made it very difficult for ships to work together in the contemporary moment. Um, and one of the things that I think is kind of interesting about this emerging uh, in, with navies, for instance, is because it does draw on this maritime tradition, right? Because the oceans are, in some ways, anathema to human inhabitation, right? It's, of course, a very kind of, it's, kind of, it's still kind of amazing to me that boats float. I know the physics of it, but it still seems kind of amazing. You see like an aircraft carrier, you think, surely not. Um, 
but you know, the idea that in a crisis you always are supposed to help someone in need, right? There is a sort of humanitarian, or if you will, a humanist tradition in the, in the seas, and they're kind of harnessing that to build this kind of global statist project. So I mentioned communications. One of the um, things that they're trying to build here, and here's where, again, you might start to feel a bit cynical about things, um, is maritime domain awareness. And essentially what the U.S. Navy would like to do is to become a clearinghouse for all sort of naval data that they can get a hold of. Uh, and so they have these AIS numbers, uh, which is, I mean, we're all kind of familiar with this with planes, right? But, you know, there's like a identifying beacon kind of a thing, so you can see where all the planes are in the air. Well, it turns out ships have that, at least ships over a certain size. Uh, and so the idea is that all of that information should be shared so you could have a sort of global awareness of where all the ships are at all times. Um, and there's all kinds of reasons they might want to do that, right? But it does kind of turn all of these assets in the global network of navies and also ports and whatnot into sensors, right? So you can have real-time data collection. Uh, and of course, all that data has to go somewhere. So presumably it would be the U.S. Navy that's running these data fusion centers where they kind of collate it and process it and make it into these kind of Jerry Bruckheimer film maps. That's, I, always, I always think of this as the desire to produce a sort of Jerry Bruckheimer-esque uh, ability to intervene anywhere at any time. So C4 ISR is one of these acronyms I warned you about. Uh, it stands for Command, Control, Communications, Computers, uh, Intelligence, Surveillance, and Reconnaissance Systems. That's kind of an umbrella thing for this kind of technology, which, as you might imagine, the U.S. Navy kind of leads the way on. And the idea is that once you collect all this data, and we had some discussions about big data earlier, that you can analyze that data over time, and not only do you start to see kind of variations in the pattern, but you could actually have automatic responses, because what happens is most ships actually go on a very small amount of the ocean. There is, you know, kind of the fastest trade routes to get from one place to another. And so even though it's this big wide ocean, most ships are in a very small part of the sea. And so if you started to see variations in that, uh, either ships going where they shouldn't go, or sh ships being somewhere where they aren't normally there at that time, uh, you could, for instance, send a Coast Guard ship or something to check it out. So, um, this, as I mentioned, is kind of an issue because of the, the shifting technologies, right? All sorts of navies have all kinds of different technologies. And so upgrading that and making it interoperable is, is not an easy thing. Plus, there is something else that's kind of inherent to the sea, which is that it doesn't have great broadband connections. These ships don't go around, you know, hauling cables behind them to get the uh, incredibly gorgeous edgerome uh, stuff that we're used to having here. And so most communications between ships occur via satellites, and satellite uplinks, if, uh, if you've ever used one, are not great for data. So, um, and that's even if you have the good stuff, right? So uh, there has been, the latest development that I'm aware of anyway is this thing called, Cent well, Centrix is a large system of systems, so to speak. The US uses Centrix for sharing intelligence with allies in kind of tactical situations, uh, both in the air and at sea and in land. But this one centric Spock is, if you will, a, um, uh, a very kind of down and dirty, you can see it, it's almost like a, it's literally a suitcase. It's a suitcase with a satellite phone in it uh, and an antenna connection and a cryptographic device so that you can encode your stuff. What's interesting about this suitcase is it costs only about $10,000, which, you know, for the US Navy is like the cost of a toilet. Um, and it takes two days to install and to train up the people to use it. So here at the bottom right, you can see they've installed it on a Peruvian ship uh, and trained them how to use it. And then immediately that ship is kind of able to enter into this uh, shared database. Okay? And um, it's not brilliant. It allows you to uh, use a satellite phone to call other people. It has chat functions, email. Uh, and something called the common operational picture, which is this kind of cartographic uh, information. So ships can each share what they see, essentially, uh, and have a common map of where, for instance, other ships are in the area. Um, but it does have its limits, like you can't Skype on it, you know, that, that would just be too much. So anyway, it's these kinds of technologies that are sort of, if you will, unleashing uh, the next level up of interoperability. 
So what are the other things they have to do, right? I've kind of focused on these technologies, um, but a couple of policy initiatives are out there as well. Uh, one is, of course, it's, you know, it's not just about the, the ability for the ships to network, it's about people as well, right? These ships are full of sailors who have been trained in national traditions and don't necessarily understand um, each other linguistically, obviously, but also in terms of procedures. That, you know, that's another aspect of the maritime tradition that's kind of tricky, right? Ships and navies have these long histories that they kind of treasure, right? It's one of the ways in which you get people to feel uh, connected to the institution. So they are proposing to increase the large number, already large number, of multilateral exercises and combined operations, in other words, practicing, working together under simulated conditions, um, producing doctrinal convergence. That sounds very religious, but um, essentially it involves uh, the kind of tactical plans that you have in advance for situations so that people are kind of expecting to do the same thing under certain circumstances. Um, you even are starting to see institutional convergence. So the U.S. and the Royal Navy just signed this combined sea power memorandum in which they, I mean, they already are probably the two most cooperative navies in the world, but they're even now kind of planning, force planning together. So in other words, we'll build this kind of ship, you build that kind of ship, and that way we're not replicating our, each other's capabilities, right? That's a pretty serious level of commitment. Um, Anyway, open course standards, et cetera. I'm running a little bit short on time, so I will keep going. Um, so how does this produce a range of geographies? Right? I'm a political geographer, so I have to bring it back to this kind of stuff. One is that it is a kind of techno-fantasy. right? I've alluded to this with my Jerry Bruckheimer, um, not quite jokes, because they weren't funny, but I think there is something uh, uh, sort of fantastical about this, this vision, right? Maritime domain, in, uh, maritime domain awareness. Um, it's about, if you will, producing a statification of, of maritime space. And there's a, a lot of books that have been written that are quite good on imagining maritime spaces as something that is uh, antithetical to state control. Again, black sails, I'll tell you, pirates, they're, they're everywhere. Um, so um, there's this kind of techno fantasy. Then, secondly, as I mentioned, there's a sort of altruistic motives, which I, I don't doubt, but equally, this will benefit some more than others, right? So the US, as, a, as the center of data fusion, will have access to all the information, which means they could also cut people out of that if they needed to. Uh, it also means that everyone is adapting uh, or adopting American standards in all of these ways, right? It's US technology that's getting pushed out. Everybody is being brought into the US orbit. And some have noted that kind of China gets left out of these discussions. And so there is some theorization that maybe it's basically an anti-China move um, and of course, the very idea of maintaining the global commons, making sure that everyone can sail everywhere, benefits those who have a global presence and global trade ambitions. And the U.S. obviously is very dependent on global trade, at least for the moment. <laughs> Check in in a year and see if the lights are still on. Um, uh, and but also there is this kind of building up of regionalism, right? It's not that navies don't have interoperabilities, it's that they have different interoperabilities. So often, uh, for instance, navies in South America have cooperated, adopted common standards, etc. But they're just different standards than those that are in Southeast Asia. And so the US is, if you will, trying to take these regional standards and slowly kind of bring them in meshing with one another. It's, it's a process rather than something that can be done all at once. Um, as I mentioned, what we're looking at both bodies and technologies and the way that they're being recoded and re-territorialized. You can see I have a little assemblage conceptions, just so you know I actually do read that stuff. Um, and the idea is that this will be productive over time of interoperabilities. On the right is a picture from uh, promotional materials for one of these combined, um, what do you call them? Uh, uh, combined operations, right? This thing called exercise open game, also known as Saharan Express. Uh, and the, the, it says here, there's no problem too great and no contribution too small for the global network of navies. So it's not just for the big boys. But what I think is interesting is the description of this mission. I, I Googled it, open game express. It says, exercise open game slash Saharan Express provides African, European, South American, and US partner maritime forces the opportunity to work together share information, and refine tactics, techniques, and procedures in order to assist Gulf of Guinea maritime nations 
with building capacity, this is a long sentence, to monitor and enforce their territorial waters and exclusive economic zones, right? So it's a, in the end, it's about territorializing the water, the economic zones, and making sure that they don't become susceptible to uh, either piracy or other kind of non-state actors, right? So, you know, who is it that benefits from this kind of statification? Well, it's states in general, right? So that's the kind of a fundamental Deleuzean point, is that this is a, uh, an attempt to kind of rigidify and stratify these spaces such that they are not, uh, you know, uh, you know, susceptible to colonization by other kinds of political forces, right? The kinds of things that Brian was talking about, right? A sort of anarchic war machine. So, what remains to be done? Uh, basically everything I'm hoping this summer to do interviews with policymakers and naval officers to find out exactly how this is proceeding. I am slightly afraid that this is a, a, a project that's only on paper. I've yet to find anyone who actually uh, has participated in it. I wonder if it's one of those things where they're like, oh, Admiral Mullen likes it. Well, let's all say we're going to do it, and then he's going to retire in a little bit, and nobody's taken the website down. Um, but if, if this particular project doesn't exist, you know, there are other naval interoperabilities that are definitely proceeding, like that uh, maritime partnership that I mentioned between the US and UK. And then the dream is to do a kind of ethnography, because the weakness of my last book, which uh, if any of you review the book, forget I said this, um, is that it really doesn't get to the actual embodied level. It, my past book really looks at, uh, it interviews policymakers, it reviews historical documents, I kind of project onto that what I understand everyday people to be doing, for instance, in World War II um, intelligence cooperation, you know, but I didn't interview those people, I, I didn't watch it happening. And so I'm really interested in trying to get at the, the everyday life of the sailors who are involved in these things, and how it is that their training is being remade, their sort of embodied habits, the way in which they engage with their ships and with each other. Um, and that's going to require some sort of ride-along thing, which I actually have some sort of hope that I might be able to do. Uh, I've, I've got glimmers of yes from some Navy people. So fingers crossed that, that works. Thank you all very much.